So uh, we continue. It was before the, just the introduction, and in fact, we have already uh, made some progress. You know, the notion of, con of feedback in the control structure. You see that Luigi needs some control to work. So uh, the, before designing the control laws, what we need is to analyze the performance of the system. <coughs> So we have to introduce the different concepts so that we will be able, at the end of the chapters here, we will be able to define which, is, uh, which, which are the best tools to analyze stability, rapidity, and accuracy. And with these tools, then we will consider them again for the design of the control in a second step. Okay? So as I explained at the beginning, I will do mostly in parallel the analysis of uh, feedback systems in continuous time and discrete time. So let's avoid some kind of redundancy in some parts. But in the slides you have, slides part number three is for the continuous time case and part number four for the discrete time case. And in the slides you have, there is always at the beginning a summary of the main concept of the chapters and then examples, application example of this, and I will use in some slides, not all, but some slides for the application, just to, to show you how it is applied and uh, how the main theorems are applied on, based on the same examples all over the, the slides and the chapters. So, the, this big, very big chapters is the analysis of control system And for, at the same time, continuous and discrete time system. So I merge two uh, parts in, in the book you have. I hope you can see me, uh, what I've written in the back, because it's the, with the sun it's not so easy to see. Anyway, okay, so uh, first is, if you remember, the main concept is feedback. And feedback is closed loop. So we have to close the loop. And when you study and when you define the notion of system, a system is alone. So that's what we call an open loop, without feedback. So we had to move from what you know already, which is open loop, how to deal with feedback system, with closed loop system. So the first part is what are the tools to move from open loop to closed loop? That's what we will consider from open loop to closed loop system. open loop to closed loop and that at the end I will give you the philosophy the philosophy will be the same if you understand the philosophy then you will understand uh, all the theorems and all the tools we will define so from open loop to closed loop and uh, first in the continuous time case just as a reminder what we have seen before continuous time case, what you have, if I consider the, the main tool is the block diagram. If you remember the block diagram, what you have, you need to define a controller. So you, finally, you will implement the controller. That will be your goal at the end. You have to find this one. And if you are with transfer function formalism, that will be a transfer function. If you are in discrete time, let's write CS, the, the, the transfer function of the controller. Then you have your system. I merge the actuator, just consider only one block. Then you have your system and assume that it's GS, the transfer function of your system. Okay? Um, then the system, of course, you have disturbance and what we want is to reject disturbance on the system. Part of, of the problem because you need to have good properties. Uh, the signal here is the control signal. So that's the control signal. And here you have the output, which is Y. Y, T, this is the output. 
And the last ingredient you need is the sensor. You need to measure to, to introduce the notion of feedback. So you measure the output, you go through a sensor, which transfer function is mu beta s. Usually beta is just a gain, assuming that your sensor is linear or linearized, or linear on the, in, within the range you need. So you have the sensor, you compare, so it's a plus minus. Here you have the signal E, which is the set point. And here you have M, which is the measure. So this is your signal, your block diagram with your signal. Then you have, when you start with the problem, you have to formalize with this uh, representation, how to define the, the system, what is the, the gain or the transfer function of the sensor, and then finally you will have to find the controller. Okay, so some, base, some very important definition. First, what we call, and I will write like this, the block, all the blocks here, in this part, uh, this is what we call uh, the direct path. That means that this is the transfer directly from the, I've missed one point, which is the error signal here. This is the transfer directly from the error to the output. This is the direct path. And the other one, which is only uh, the sensor usually, this is what we call the feedback, feedback path. So direct one and feedback one, because this is the notion of feedback. Is that here you close the loop. If this part is open here, you are again in open loop. Okay. So this explain in particular why the sensor must be reliable, just to be sure that you. The, first, the measurement is correct and you do not open the loop again. So, some definition. Definition number one. What is the definition of the open loop? What is the open loop transfer function? Open loop transfer function is the relation, and I will write it always H, S. I try to take always the same formulation. Open loop, it will be H, okay? The system, it will be G, and the controller, it will be C, and the sensor beta. Try to use always the same notation. So H, the open loop, this is the ratio between the measurement m over epsilon. This is the product of all the blocks in the loop, <coughs> including the sensor. So after the measure, after the sensor, you consider the measure. So this is the product C, G, beta. Do not forget beta. This is the definition of the open loop transfer function from the measurement compared to the epsilon signal. Okay, now it's a, an important transfer function, but what we want to characterize, it's the closed loop behavior. So I need to define what is the closed loop. And that's second definition. What is the closed loop transfer function? So the closed loop, I will use always the same definition, F, notation, F, and I will calculate it right now, but try to have this in mind. It's not necessary to uh, make this calculation again and again. You can have this in mind. It's quite easy to, to have in mind. 
It's the relation between the output compared to the input, but with the feedback. So this is the ratio Y, which is the real output, compared to the set point E, with respect to the set point. Okay? I use the capital letter when it is uh, in the Laplace domain, and small uh, normal letter when it's time domain. All right? So Y over E, what is it? So just make the calculation once here and then try to have this uh, easier to memorize. So first, what is Y? Y S, this is the product C, G, Epsilon. If you follow on the block diagram, Y, you have the product C, G and times Epsilon. Okay? And epsilon, this is the difference between the input, E, minus the measure. Or the difference between the input minus beta, Y. Since the measure signal is beta times Y. Okay? So if you combine both, then you will obtain y s equal c g times e minus beta y I've just replaced epsilon here and if you compact this and have y on the left, all y on the left, you will obtain y s times 1 plus c g beta equal c g oops, times e, c g e. And that's it, you have the closed loop transfer function you have the closed loop transfer function which is f again so it's just the ratio uh, y over E, that means C G divided by 1 plus C G beta so you have this definition here of the closed loop and you can have this in mind, C G is the direct pass and C G beta is just H, the open loop transfer function. So this is, once again, this is uh, C G over 1 plus H, or even if you want to have H everywhere, this is 1 over beta, and usually beta is a gain only, times H over 1 plus H. You multiply by beta and divide as well. So usually try to have this in mind. You never go back to the calculation of this closed loop. It must be uh, quite automatic to have this in mind. Uh, CG over 1 plus H and you have the result. So this is the closed loop and according to what we said before, what we want is to characterize the behavior of our system in closed loop. So we should consider H, uh, F, and not H. Okay? Because F is the closed loop. The problem is that F is usually rather complicated, more complex than H. So the global philosophy will be the following in the future. If I write it now, it will be the same in discrete time, of course. But the philosophy. for the future 
So that means in the future section, if I, what I need is to determine the behavior of the closed loop. So normally I should consider f, but f is too complex. So the question is, can I consider only h, which is easier to determine, it's just a product of the three blocks. If I can obtain the behavior of the closed loop only considering the open loop transfer function, that will be much more easy to do that. So the philosophy will be find the appropriate tools to characterize the behavior of the closed loop only looking at the open loop transfer function, which is easier to do. And if you understand that, you understand all the basic structure of this, of this chapter, which is define the tools looking at H only. And I will almost never calculate the closed loop. Just once here, but mainly never go back. So the philosophy is uh, determine the behavior of the closed loop system, which should be determined by f, but I will never calculate f, in fact, only looking at the tr open loop transfer function. which is h. Okay? And this is the point only looking at this transfer function. So, you will see I will stress these points once uh, in the next section related to this philosophy. So, this is the open loop transfer function you have and the closed loop. We are considering the closed loop behavior, but we will mainly uh, calculate the, 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 the open loop. So this is for the continuous time case. Discrete time one is quite the same, but a little bit more complex due to the Z transform, but you have the same philosophy. Uh, discrete time case. So I will remind you the, boat the block diagram of the of the system. So you remember, on one side you have the continuous si your continuous system. On the other side you have the computer and you have to, um, to have the interface in between. So if I represent this, you have your, here you have your system, which is represented by the transfer function G, as before. You have the output and the sensor. Uh, sensor which is beta is the measurement M and that was the control signal U. Okay, this is your continuous, your system you want to control. And instead of having a controller in continuous time, you want to implement the controller in a computer. So, on the other side, you have you have the the controller it's okay with the green yeah so you have the controller but the controller is a discrete one so it's cz now right and at the end you have the control signal which is discrete signal at different time interval as I shown you before. 
your signal, the set point, is a discrete one. It can come from a uh, continuous time signal, which you sample as well. But assume now it's in the computer, it's a discrete one. Then you have to close the oops, oops, same level. You have to close the loop, and you need M of K, which is a discrete signal. And of course, it's a minus and plus. So this part in green is a digi digital part. Here you have your continuous time part. And in between, as I showed you before, you have the interface. So you have two converters, digital to analog converters with the sampling period TE. It's a zero order hold, as we have seen. And the other one is the sampler. So you, you take the value of your signal here with the sampling period TE. So it's a analog to digital converter or it's a sampler. So you sample your control your signal to obtain discrete time values. Regularly spaced with the space defined with the choice of the sampling period. Okay, and if you need, I, I will need for the, the representation, you can have an additional, it's just a fictive one, but if I need, I can have uh, another one here, analog to digital converter, so that I will obtain Y of K, which is the equivalent, which is just fictive, because my system is continuous, but just for the mathematical representation, for further representation. Okay. Now, this is a hybrid system. You have a mixture, which is not so easy to manipulate. You have a mixture of continuous time. Uh, here it's discrete time. Here you have the interface. It's not really convenient to model. And what I need, as said before, it would be nice if I can derive from this. So this is the real one. This is the one, well, as it is implemented with the, the I.O. cards you can buy, the computers and your system. But it's not convenient for use. It will be nice as um, a virtual representation if I can have one completely discrete with only Z transform or Z transfer function. So what I am looking for is, in fact, a representation like this where I have CZ, the controller, it remains. Here I have E signal, you have the error, you have the control signal. Then I can have GZ between U and Y. And another block, which is GM over G. I will show you why with M being the measurement. That's the goal I want to reach and you will understand in a while why I have to divide by G to define GM. Just wait a second to understand. So my, my goal is to obtain this transfer, this representation. Why? Because, as I showed you before, to define transfer function in Z, you need to have the environment in between. Uh, you have your continuous time transfer function, and on the left and the right, you need to have the converters. And with these three blocks, you can calculate the equivalent transfer function as I've defined before. So the first one I can derive is if I can calculate the equivalent transfer function of these three blocks. Zero order hold, continuous time, and 
simpler. That's I know. I've shown you the, the way to obtain this before. So, and that will be GZ. It's the link between U and Y. This is the equivalent of these three blocks. So GZ, that's the first I can calculate. GZ, this is the Z transform of the block digital to analog converters, GS and analog to digital converter. This is these three blocks together. And that you know. The result is 1 minus Z minus 1, the Z transform of GS over S. That's what I've shown you before. You remember the proof with the inverse response and so on. So this is the first block. Now I need the link between M and U. And this is the only one I can calculate. I cannot calculate directly this part alone because I need before a zero or the hold, which I have not. So the only one I can calculate now is this loop, this transfer function. You have at the beginning this converter, then the blocks here, and then the sampler. And I cannot calculate this one alone with only the sampler because there is no zero or the hold before. So what I call GM is the ratio M over U. And GM this is the Z transform of the converter the product G beta and the analog sampler, analog to digital converter at the end. And that you know, this is 1 minus Z minus 1, the Z transform of G beta over S. It's the same relation, but you have beta now. So these are the two transfer functions I can define, G and GM, because you always need both converter in between, uh, before and after the transfer function, the continuous time transfer function. So to calculate what is in the feedback, you cannot do this directly only looking at beta because the zero or the hold is missing. Before is missing. So once you have GM and G, G you have the direct link, and to consider what is in the feedback loop, it's not GM directly because GM is the product of all. It's the ratio GM over G. That's what I've written GM over G in the feedback. Okay? Because if you consider that GM, what I, I, I need to represent is the, the ratio MZ over YZ, which is the feedback. This is M over U. Uh, times u over y. m over u is gm. And u over y is the inverse of g. Well, this is g. That's what is in the feedback. Okay? So this is, again, y over u. And this is m over you. And then I completed the, the block diagram. So when you want to calculate the um, an, an, um, a block diagram which is completely discrete, you need to have this representation with G and GM calculated like this. This is the only blocks you can have in terms of that transfer function. Of course, you can simplify, and that's usually the case. If beta equal 1, then gm and g are the same, of course. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the block diagram is simplified with the controller C 
the transfer function G and a unit feedback. When beta is 1, it's easier to define. In this case, that's what you, we call a unit feedback. Unit feedback is when the, feed, the feedback is equal to 1. But globally, the most complete block diagram is the one here you have on the right. So now, if we consider this, I will just uh, erase, remove the upper part here. You will manipulate all this during the practice session and lab work, of course, but you need to have this in mind, in particular the relationship there on the, on the left. Now, based on this block diagram, what is the open loop and what is the closed loop? And I need to define the same as I've defined in continuous time. So, for the open loop transfer function, so H Z, so again, H, that's the, the, my notation for the open loop. The open loop transfer function, this is the product, so this is the, the ratio M over epsilon. Epsilon is here. So this is the product C, G, M. You have simplification of G. This is the open loop. And this is the one we will consider, <laughs> based on the, the philosophy I've written before. Of course, if beta is 1, gm and g are the same. Mm -hmm. So it's cg only. And what about the closed loop? Well, the closed loop transfer function. So this is F. F is um, is Y over the input E. Well, you have to make the calculation once again. It's a little bit more complex than before. Or if you apply this, the relation we have before, considering that beta is this now. Uh, without any calculation, you will obtain the product CG divided by 1 plus CGM. You just replace CG beta, beta equal GM over G, G cancel, and it remains 1 plus CGM. So this is the definition of the closed loop transfer function. We will mainly consider only the open loop and deduce all the results for the closed loop based on the open loop, as before, I, as I explained before. Uh, CGM is the, the, the open loop, so that can be written as being CG over 1 plus H. That's another way of formulation for that. But have this in mind. The most important one is this one, CGM. And when, C, when beta is 1, it's only G everywhere. G and GM is the same. Mm -hmm. So now, where we are, we know that we have to work with control system. That's the notion of feedback. And to do that, in terms of analysis of performance, we have defined what is the open loop, what is the closed loop. And now, um, the idea is, either in continuous or discrete time, I will study the open loop and have all the properties, derive all the properties for the closed loop, which is what I'm looking for, because that's the closed loop system I'm considering. Okay? 
one first idea because be to, before speaking in terms of stability, rapidity, and uh, accuracy, can be just a simple idea. How can I move from the boat diagram of the open loop? How can I derive the boat diagram or an approximation, a flavor of the boat diagram of the closed loop without calculating the closed loop? Okay, so it's part of my philosophy, just at the magnitude, not the phase, but looking at the magnitude. And that can be just as a starting point in many, many problems or um, system you have to consider in industry. You just need to have a first approximation to have some ideas and then you go deeper into details if you need. But just as a beginning, let's start. You have the bow diagram, you have the magnitude of the open loop. What can be done? to obtain the boat diagram of the closed loop, but without the calculation of the closed loop, just an approximation. Of course, if you need the, uh, the complete one in closed loop, then you, un you ask MATLAB and MATLAB will do that for you. But then you, you need to understand what MATLAB has done to be sure to, uh, to uh, exploit the, the correct boat diagram. So it should be useful to have just an idea at the beginning. So that's the last point in this first paragraph. If I need to consider the boat diagram of the closed loop, what is an approximation? So that's either in continuous or discrete time. That's the same uh, approximation. So approximation of the magnitude of the um, frequency representation of f in the boat plane. So I have the magnitude of the open loop. So you remember the boat diagram, you have the magnitude, and you have two parts. In fact, you have the magnitude and the face. Okay? So I just consider the magnitude. So the magnitude, you consider omega, and it's never in hertz. In control, you're never looking, speaking in terms of hertz. It's only radian per second. This is the angular frequency, always. Even if in MATLAB it's written frequency, the unit is radio per second. Look at that in MATLAB. <laughs> uh, so this is radio per second, and this is the angular frequency. And usually you have a semi-log plot here, and you have the magnitude in decibel, and that's the open loop. So what I have is the magnitude of H in decibel. And I write a dot here, meaning that it should be either S of Z. It's, val it's uh, valid either in continuous or in discrete time. So imagine you have such kind of representation like this. And to simplify, assume that beta is 1. So in my representation here, assume beta equal to 1. It's just to simplify, you can deduce the same if beta is 2 or 3 or whatever a constant. So assume beta is 1. So this is the open loop. I, un I have in mind to derive the magnitude of the closed loop, so the magnitude of f. So what is F? F, if beta is 1, it's easy. You consider here, it's Cg over 1 plus Cgm, but G and Gm are the same. And Cg is H in this case. So this is directly H over 1 plus H. And it's the same in continuous or discrete time. OK, what I have is h. So it can be 
nice if I can go back to H from this ratio here. In fact, you have two, two, two possibilities. First case, magnitude of H is greater than 1. 1 is 0 decibel in decibel. In this case, if it's greater than 1, the approximation is, uh, is 1. Yeah. It's equal to 1. And second case, if the magnitude of H is less than 1, then the approximation is H. You neglect H compared to 1. So you have two plots. First one is H. That's nice. I have it. Second one is 1. 1 in decibel, that's 0. So the other one, so 1 is this one. That's H. And the other one is 0 decibel. So this is H and this is 0 decibel means 1. Now you have to combine both depending on the domain where they are, va they are valid. So if magnitude of H is greater than 1, that means greater than 0 decibel. So you have the border is here. In this part, the magnitude of H is greater than 1, which is 0 decibel. And on the right, the magnitude of H is smaller than 1. Right? Because here you are positive, here you are negative. When you are positive, you take the approximation 1. That means that the approximation of the closed loop will be this part here. And when I'm less than 1, it's h, so back to this one. So what is represented in red here, this is the approximation of the closed loop magnitude. It's just an approximation because the main problem is what happened here. And here I have no way to find it, looking at that. But minimum you have some good ideas. Now if you, go, if you want to go further, then you have to, appro to, to use MATLAB and to compute the real plot. Uh, MATLAB, you have the, the, the function uh, NICORS that will plot you the closed loop and you will obtain this in the NICORS plane and then you can deduce in the both plane. So the problem is what happened here? Based on my approach here, I have no idea. There may be some resonance. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on your system. But at least you, have, you, you already have a good shape. You know already some uh, good um, point about this, uh, trans this representation. So just to show you, so I will show you here in continuous time, but it will be the same in discrete time. If you consider the slide of part number three, uh, in the example, So, just consider this example that I will consider in the future for the red line in the different chapters. Uh, you have a unit feedback, you have a transfer function, so the controller for the moment is one because my problem is not to design a controller, just consider the controller is one. My system is represented by G, where the system is 100 over S, and so you have an integrator and you have two time constants, and you have one corner frequency which is 100, another corner frequency which is 1000 radian per second. So it's an integrator plus two time constants. Okay? If you can look at the, the, so again, the system, 
The open loop, as I've defined before, is the product of all the blocks. So here is the product CG. C is equal to 1, so it's only G. And the closed loop is G over 1 plus G. So if I need to, to calculate this, I, I should calculate. It's quite complex because you already have a third order transfer function. So it takes time. OK, so you start with the frequency plot of the open loop. So you have the Bode diagram of the open loop transfer function, which is the Bode diagram of G here only. So if you analyze this Bode diagram, you have uh, an integrator at the beginning. So you have a slope at the beginning of minus 20 decibel per decade. So if you are not familiar with the Bode diagram, how to plot this, uh, look at the exercise you have in the in Eduna, now or try to, um, to, Im to improve uh, your knowledge about this because we need to interpret, not to f maybe not to plot directly from scratch a bow diagram, but if you have the result from MATLAB, you must be able to understand what MATLAB has plotted. So you must be quite familiar with the bow diagram. So you start with the uh, slope at minus 20 decibel, then you have a first corner frequency at 100, then the slope becomes a minus 2, that means minus 40 decibel per decade. And after 1,000 radian per second, you have a slope at minus 3, which is minus six, uh, 60, uh, 60 decibel per decade. And for the phase, you start at minus 90, then minus 180, and minus 270. So you, you lose 90 degrees when you face one corner frequency, and then the same for the second one. So this is the Bode diagram. This is the yellow curve here, what I have, OK? Approximation. Since beta is 1, if the magnitude of g is greater than 1, the closed loop approximation is 1. So this is this part. And if not, this is equal to g, so this is the other part. So you have the closed loop in blue here. And the problem again is what happened here at the intersection of the two domains. So if you plot this with MATLAB, MATLAB you enter G, you calculate the closed loop, and you ask for the Bode diagram of the closed loop. That will give you this result. And you see that you have a small resonance here that you cannot imagine based on my approach here. It's just an approximation. But at least, you have a good flavor at what can be the shape between, after, and of course, just at the intersection, you have no idea, but still a good understanding of the other parts. OK? So that's just an idea uh, of how to derive this. But OK, that was the example and the, uh, the strategy to do that. That's the opportunity to define a very important notion here, which is the intersection here, the intersection of H with the axis 0 decibel. This is done here at a specific frequency, which I will call omega C. And I will use omega C in many, many other um, tools for stability, rapidity, and, uh, and accuracy if needed. So having omega C, what is the meaning of that? Um, omega C, this is what we call the cross over angular frequency the cross over angular frequency this is the frequency where the open loop crosses 0 decibel and the Bode diagram where the Bode diagram crosses 0 decibel this is what we call the crossover angular frequency. So this is in radian per second. And it's defined omega c such that the magnitude of h at this frequency equal to 1 or 0 decibel. 
This is the intersection with the x-axis. Okay? So that's the crossover angular frequency. This is a very important uh, notion for the future. Do not make the confusion with here. When I, I, was, I was mentioning here, you see you have S, S over 100 and 1000 here. 100 and 1000, this is the special frequency where the asymptotic plot changes, the slope changes. This is what we call the corner frequency. Corner frequency, these are some poles or zeros in the transfer function. It's completely different with the concept of crossover frequency. Crossover frequency, that's the intersection of the open loop plot in the, in the boat diagram with zero decibel. Corner frequency, it's one pole or one zero. That's the variation of the slope in the plot of the magnitude and the phase. Okay. Uh, what we define as being the interval zero omega c, that's what we call the bandwidth of the system. It's the same concept as uh, in electronics. You find the notion of bandwidth as well. That's the bandwidth of the system. And you see, the bandwidth, these are all the frequencies where the magnitude is positive. So if you, you send a signal, you will amplify this signal. After, you filter. So the idea you have in electronics and in system here in control is to extend the bandwidth. If you have a large bandwidth, then it will be better than having a small one because you will amplify this signal instead of filtering the signal. So if the bandwidth is higher, that can help. That's what we will see in the future. Okay? So this is the notion of bandwidth. Omega C is the crossover frequency. And uh, I can always maybe say that Consider omega c as the bandwidth, so it's just an approximation. It's the crossover frequency, but that's the notion of bandwidth, right? So that's the first part, uh, first idea, how to move from open loop to closed loop. If you consider the Bode diagram, you see, uh, I just look at h, then I can have an idea of what is f in the, of the magnitude. If I need to be uh, more um, accurate in the plot, then I can use MATLAB or whatever. But that gives you already some good result. So that was for the first, now we have the notion of open loop and closed loop. Now we start with the most important section because if stability is not fulfilled, then you cannot speak in terms of rapidity and accuracy. It's nonsense because you must be stable if you want to speak in terms of rapidity and accuracy. So what is for stability of closed loop system? I, I have to define uh, the notion of stability first because there are many, many ideas what about stability. Uh, what kind of stability we consider uh, for closed loop system? So, first point is, what is the definition here? Uh, we will say that a system, not necessarily a closed loop system, just look at the concept of stability for the moment. Definition, it's the definition of stability for a system. What we will consider here. A system is what we call BIBO stable, BIBO for bounded input, bounded output. That means it's if you uh, apply to your system a step, for example, which is a bounded input, then the output will remain bounded. It, it will not diverge. That's the meaning of BIBO stability. That's bounded input. Bounded output. <coughs> so 
So a system is Bebo stable if and only if uh, moved from an its equilibrium point moved from its equilibrium point it will go back to this equilibrium point when the excitation stops. So you have applied an excitation to your system. Imagine you have a pendulum, a normal one. You move from uh, the equilibrium point, which is the vertical position, like this. So you have an excitation to your system. You stop the action. Once you stop the action, your system will go back to equilibrium, or maybe with oscillation, it depends on the properties, but it will go back to this. So this is the definition or the, the visualization of what is bounded, uh, input bounded, output stability. So move from its equilibrium point, it will go back to this point. So I continue there. It will go back to this point when the external action stops. So you, you apply an action to your system, you move from the equilibrium point, and when you stop this action, you go back to this point. So, and it will not diverge. That's the opposite of uh, the inverse pendulum. When you excite, you, you move from its equilibrium point, what will happen? It will never go back by itself, without control, of course. It will never go back, it will fall down. So this, it, it is not Bebo stable, okay? That's the definition. Now, uh, when you have a transfer function, so it's just a system alone for the moment. Um, if you consider Consider a transfer function, or a system, uh, represented by G. G S. Or, can be, uh, I can do that the same, like this, do that or. So you have G, which represents your transfer function, your system. Considering this model, how can you say that the system will be Bebo stable or not? What will you consider in the transfer function to characterize stability? So your system is represented by G, you have a numerator, and you have a denominator. Okay? By the way, the roots of the numerator, this is what we call the zeros of the transfer function and the root of the numerator and the roots of the denominator, these are the poles of the transfer function. So the roots here, these are the zeros, and the roots here, these are the poles. Okay? What do you consider in a transfer function to characterize the stability? The zeros or the poles? The poles. If you look at the poles, this is the identity card again of your system. Show me what are your poles, I will tell you if you are stable or not. These are the, the, the characterization of the stability. So, if you are in continuous time domain, the border of stability, this is the imaginary axis. So if you are in continuous time domain, if you have a transfer function, here, you have the real part of your poles, the imaginary part of your poles, so that's the roots of D. If you are here, this domain, where the poles are with real part 
strictly negative, this is on the roots of D, the poles of the transfer function, then you are in the field of stability. This is Bebo stability. Bebo stability is characterized by the poles with real part strictly negative. That means that if you go back to the time domain, you will have decreasing exponential and that will go back to zero. If you are on the other side, zero or positive, then you will be at the limit here, but mainly unstable. This is the unstable part. So here, this is the unstable unstable system. So this is one step further. The condition when we want to derive stability in the future is if I want to have a if I want to consider a system which is Bebo stable, I have to look at the pole and all the poles must be with real parts strictly negative. This is the condition in continuous time. What is the equivalent in discrete time? The image of the, the border here, it's here the border. This is the imaginary axis. So this is for s equal to zero. The equivalent in, in the z plane, this is z equal to one. So this is the unit circle, okay? So if you consider the unit circle, again, real and imaginary axis, so it should be a circle. So you have a unit circle, plus one, minus one, minus e, plus e here. If you are stable, if you are a system which is Bebo stable, here you have Bebo stability when you are inside the unit circle. Bebo stability, that means that the roots of the denominator d, that the poles, let's say pi, must be less than one in magnitude. If you are Bebo stable, all the poles pi of the transfer function must be inside the unit circle. If you are on the circle, outside the circle, then you are unstable. Okay, so this is the parallel between continuous and discrete time transfer function. Uh, S equal to zero, it's the border here. Z equal to one is the border in the discrete time domain. You will find again this S and Z when you consider the final value theorem where the value is for S going to zero or Z going to one. So this is the same uh, parallel. Okay, so. This was in general, that was the definition. And this is how to characterize. You look at the stability domain on the left or inside the circle. Now, back to what is interesting for me, which is the closed loop system. What is the definition? How can I consider this definition in the framework of a closed loop system? So I will start with F first. And at the end, if I can go back to H, that will be part of my philosophy. So, apply this definition to F. Just, I, I keep the definition right now. And I will remove after. So, now, for sta stability uh, of a closed loop system, And if I write in stability, it's of course Bebo stability, okay? So a closed loop system is Bebo stable. Just apply this definition or what we have here on the, on the, on the diagram, which is the explanation with the, the transfer function. A closed loop system is Bebo stable if and only if what? 
characterization of the closed loop system is the transfer function f, the closed loop transfer function. So apply this, the closed loop transfer function should have all its pole on the left or inside the unit circle if I have in discrete time. Hmm? So a closed loop system is Bebo stable if and only if uh, f has all its pole. So with real part less than zero if continuous case or with magnitude less than one in discrete case. And since I'm speaking in terms of closed loop system, right now I'm considering F, which is the closed loop transfer function. Okay? So my first conclusion is I have to look where are the poles located in the complex plane, either on the right or inside the unit circle, depending on the continuous or discrete time case I'm considering. Okay, we can go even further if we consider the structure of F now. And I will do that in the case of a unit feedback, but you can generalize this without uh, any problem. So, uh, for a unit feedback, just to simplify the notation and to have all together, but it can be the same with, without a unit feedback, with, on, o, other than the unit feedback. For a unit feedback, what we know that F is H over 1 plus H. That's what we know. If beta is 1, this is H. Not only F, sorry, but general case here. F H over 1 plus H. Okay. So I need to find the poles of this. What are the poles of F? So if you consider that H is N over D divided by 1 plus N over D. So this is n over n plus d, okay? Uh, so the poles of H are the roots of this polynomial. This one is a polynomial. The other one were transfer function. And the root of the polynomial in fact, this is the roots of the, num the, the roots of the numerators, the zeros of 1 plus h. The roots of the numerator of 1 plus h. Numerator of 1 plus h is n plus d. Okay? So, I can transform this sentence saying that a closed loop system A closed loop system is Bebo stable if and uh, only if, uh, so not now F has all its pole, etc., but if and only if the zeros of um, numerator of 1 plus h so numerator of 1 plus h 1 plus h is a transfer function it's n plus d over d you consider the numerator which is n plus d uh, so that's sorry it's not the zero 
the zeros of 1 plus h. That's enough. <laughs> the zeros of 1 plus h, like this, these are the roots of the numerator. So there's the zeros of 1 plus h. So if and only if the zeros of 1 plus h are with real part strictly negative in continuous time case, or uh, with magnitude less than 1 in discrete case, discrete time case. Okay? So that's uh, a big progress because now we are not considering completely f, but already 1 plus h. So it's not so far from h, you see? It's not exactly what I want, but what we will see after that, which is the Nyquist theorem, we will go back to h through this theorem. But we have to start with 1 plus h. So the condition is the zeros of 1 plus h must be like this. So that's a big progress in the approach I want to, to have in the future. So now where we are, we have characterized the, the definition of stability for a closed loop system. We know that it's a problem of the pole. We know where the pole should be located, and we are back to the study of 1 plus h, and we are looking at the zeros of 1 plus h, and we have some conditions on these zeros, the position of these zeros of 1 plus h. So have this in mind for the future. This will be used with the Nyquist theorem. Uh, we will consider not today, but uh, on Friday. So now, just to introduce the Nyquist theorem, uh, I will finish with one theorem which is useful for the Nyquist one. And I will just give the result without the proof, which can be quite long, <laughs> uh, which is the Cauchy theorem. The Cauchy theorem, it's uh, for the, the, the complex uh, transfer function or complex function um, within the Nyquist criterion. So next part now is uh, the Nyquist, how to quantify stability through the Nyquist, uh, the Nyquist uh, criterion. So part number three is the Nyquist criterion. So we have seen first part was the definition of BIBO stability in general. Second part was in the case of closed loop system, and we are back to 1 plus h. Now, first tool to study stability is the Nyquist criterion. That's the, that the one you really don't like to use, <laughs> uh, but it's the more general one you can find because it's not so easy to manipulate. We will see other uh, stability margin and so on in the Bode diagram, but we have to consider the Nyquist criterion because it's a universal one. Uh, but before doing that, what is first uh, the Cauchy theorem? So the Cauchy theorem is a tool that is used to have the proof of the, 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 the result of the Nyquist criterion. Uh, we will consider A uh, function, let's call it A, can be, uh, well, I will write it uh, A of uh, whatever uh, variable, which is not S and Z, but X, which is a complex value. It's a complex transfer, transfer function or function. So X is a complex number. Uh, we consider this function, consider a closed loop contour, a closed, sorry, a closed contour, C, that encircle a certain number of poles and zeros of A. So A is a function, or transfer function, you have poles and zeros, and these poles and zeros are, for some of them, inside this closed contour which encircle P poles of A 
and z zeros of a as well. Okay? So you have a contour which is oriented like this, for example, in the clockwise direction. So this is my contour, closed contour. Inside, you have a certain number of poles and zeros of a function a. a. So imagine you have, for example, uh, three zeros and two poles, whatever. Just an example, okay? So these are the poles, and these are the zeros. So the closed contour encircles like this and is oriented, for example here, oriented in the clockwise direction. The clockwise direction is like this. Right? The, that's the, the direction is very important because if you want to consider the proof of this, you have to look at the variation of the argument of the zeros of the poles through the transfer function, so the orientation is really important. So what is the result of the Cauchy theorem? If you consider a point here, which moves on this circle, the image of this point through the function a, so this point moving here, you take the image of this, you replace it here, and you take all the successive variation moving on this circle. This image will describe a contour, a closed contour as well, that will encircle, uh, that will encircle the origin a certain number of times. This is the result. So, and I will represent it right after. So the image of a point M, so the point M is the one I've represented here. This is M here. The image of this point moving, of a point M moving on the contour C through the function A and circle or uh, the origin a number of times equal to z minus p in the same direction. And of course, it's again a closed contour. Okay? That means with my example here, z minus p is 3 minus 2, is 1. So that means I will encircle the origin one time in the clockwise direction, in the same direction. So that the image of this through the function A will be a contour, which will be in the same direction, and you will encircle the origin just one time. Okay? Z minus P. If it would, be, it would have been minus one, if I've taken only two zeros and three poles, that would have been minus one. That means that you encircle the origin, but in the anti-clockwise direction. You change the direction. 
anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. It depends if you're English or American, you can say, you can find, or trigonometric if you prefer, trigonometric direction. Okay? So this is the, the conclusion of the Cauchy theorem. And the Nyquist criterion is based on, and on this theorem. We'll use the result on this theorem to deduce the stability. Uh, I think we will stop with this now. And we have some suspense. What is the Nyquist criterion? You will have to wait until Friday to know that. But you have the basis here. So do not forget numerator or the zeros of 1 plus h. That's the, the, the point for the stability of the studies of the stability, and we will apply this in the future. Okay? That's all for today. <laughs>